Section 17 of Edward I by Thomas Frederick Tout. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12. The Conquest of Scotland, 1297 to 1305, Part 1. The last few years of Edward's reign were full enough of bitterness to the aged monarch. His disputes with the nobility were only ended by a humiliating renunciation of the dearest prerogatives of the crown. His attack on France led to nothing better than an unsatisfactory compromise. Even his triumph over the clerical opposition was only obtained as the result of infinite heart-burnings and vexatious personal disputes. If the king's second marriage brought him some measure of domestic happiness, it was more than counterbalanced by the growing certainty that his son Edward was in every way unworthy to succeed to so great a charge as the monarchy of Britain. But all the other troubles of Edward were insignificant as compared with the chronic and growing difficulty of keeping Scotland subdued. He made many sacrifices to get leisure and opportunity to put down the stubborn pride of his Scottish subjects. But one rising was scarcely put down, then another burst out. Again and again the thankless work of conquest had to be renewed, and at last the king went down to his grave with the full consciousness that success was farther off than ever. We have followed the course of Edward's policy in Scotland down to his first conquest of that land in 1296. That conquest had been accomplished with such consummate ease that Edward very reasonably inferred that it was as final and thorough as his conquest of Wales had been twelve years before. But Scotland was not like Wales. It was not only that it was bigger, stronger, and richer than the Western Principality, though these facts in themselves went a long way to explain the difference. In the very divergencies in race and type that Scotland presented, a further explanation of these differences was to be found. Both the Scottish nobles and the Scottish people were made of sterner stuff than the excitable, hot-headed, and disorganized Welsh. It was easy, by an appeal to their interests, for Edward to obtain a temporary submission from the greedy and self-seeking Norman nobility of Scotland. But the Scots nobles only acknowledged Edward as king, so long as they believed that his distant rule would be a nominal rule. Under his guidance they expected to enjoy the turbulent independence of their brethren in Ireland and the Welsh marches. They had no love for King Edward, though they had a contempt for King John. As soon as they perceived that Edward intended that the conquest should be a real one, they began to manifest symptoms of opposition. They had not signed the Ragman Roll that English ministers should lord it over the land and ride roughshod over their most cherished liberties. Moreover, behind the politic opposition of the Scottish nobles, there lay the growing sense of indignation of the Scots people. The violent policy of Edward was gradually welding together the sturdy Anglian peasant of the Lothians, the Anglicized Gael of the Northeast, and the half Anglicized Britain of the Southwest into a real and vigorous national unity. As the Norman conquerors of England had fused together Mercian, Northumbrian, and West Saxon by common servitude, so that a single English nation, strong, determined, and united, rose out of the opposition to Angevin despotism. So now the oppressive policy of Edward in Scotland was slowly but surely creating the modern Scottish people. 
the very fact that the chief formative elements in the new nation were English only added to the severity of the struggle. The Scots, or the most vigorous part of them, shared nearly everything with their would-be conquerors, tongue, institutions, traditions, and character. It was not truly regarded a war of two races. It was more properly a civil strife, a great schism of the English race within itself. The struggle was on that account the more stubbornly and persistently fought, and all the statecraft of the great Edward could not reconcile a proud and haughty people to the extinction of its local life. The fears of the Scots nobles that Edward meant to make himself a real king may have first suggested an opposition to the conqueror. The opposition of the Scottish people to the tyranny of Edward's ministers soon made the struggle an irreconcilable one. As usual, Edward was very badly served. Just as twenty years before, all Edward's professions of allowing the Welsh of the four cantreds to continue in the enjoyment of their own laws were but a mockery in the face of the misdeeds wrought by Geoffrey de Langley in Edward's name, so now the English king's protestations that he would rule Scotland justly after the ancient way was belied by the greedy vaingloriousness of a Cressingham and the grim unreasoning severity of an Ormsby. Before long, a whole crowd of outlaws and fugitives had been driven by the severity of Edward's ministers to take refuge among the hills and moors. The misgovernment grew worse through the non-residence of Earl Warren, the king's lieutenant, who shirked the rigors of a northern winter and spring. The outlawed bands came down from their hiding places and wrecked a bloody revenge on their English oppressors. The rural population welcomed them as deliverers. Before long, guerrilla forays were exchanged for open warfare. In May of 1297, a formidable revolt broke out, headed by William Wallace, whose name, Wallace means simply the Welshman, bespoke his affinity to the old Strathclyde Welsh, and whose gentle birth, gigantic form, iron courage, unbending resolution, and persistent and heroic opposition to the English, to whom it was believed he had sworn no oaths of fealty, made him an ideal leader of a revolted nation. The people flocked to his standard with enthusiasm. More slowly and with greater caution, many of the nobles and bishops forgot their oaths to Edward and banded themselves with the national hero. Earl Warren, recalled to his post by the rebellion, was powerless to withstand the mighty rush of the popular wave. In September, Wallace put to flight the English army at Stirling Bridge and slew Hugh Cressingham, the worst of the oppressors. Next month, the victorious partisan dashed over the borders and harried Cumberland and Westmoreland. Scotland was freed from end to end. The rule of the English earl had been succeeded by the government of William Wallace and Andrew Murray, the generals of the army of the Kingdom of Scotland and the wardens of the absent King John. While the Scots' insurrection was running its course, Edward was still occupied in Flanders, whither he had taken a large army of Englishmen and Welshmen. But he made no way against the French and was involved in all sorts of difficulties with his allies. Philip the Fair burst into Flanders, captured Lille, and occupied Bruges. The conquest of Bruges cut off Edward, who was at Ghent, from the sea. A vigorous attack was therefore ordered to be made upon the French positions. The French were almost defeated when the two wings of the ill-assorted Allied army destroyed by their mutual animosities the hope of victory. The Flemings fought so fiercely with the English and Welsh about the booty that the day was lost. Boniface the Eighth, 
now offered his mediation. Both Edward and Philip were averse to recognizing any right of the Pope to interfere in his official capacity in the disputes of sovereign and independent princes, but both wished to end the struggle and agreed, while rejecting the proposals of the Pope, to accept the friendly offers of the man, Benedict of Gaeta, who then filled the papal throne. A two years' truce was patched up, which finally ripened into a definite peace. After the truce was signed, there arose a violent dispute between Edward's turbulent soldiers, largely Welsh and Irish, and the townsmen of Ghent. It culminated in a two days' pitched battle in the streets, during which Edward was exposed to considerable personal risk. Extricated from this trouble by the strenuous efforts of Count Guy, Edward had now leisure to return to Britain, where his presence was sorely needed. In March 1298, he landed in his kingdom and at once busied himself with the preparations for an expedition to suppress the revolt of Wallace. He held a hasty parliament at York, but the Scots lords, to whom summonses had been sent as well as to the English peers, unanimously disregarded his commands. The feudal levies were then summoned to meet at Roxburgh, a strong Scottish fortress that still remained in English hands. Edward piously prepared himself for his work of conquest by a pilgrimage to his favorite shrine of St. John of Beverley. On Midsummer Day, the English host mustered at Roxburgh. There was a splendid array of heavily armed knights and men-at-arms, all mounted on horseback. Edward, who was in many ways an old-fashioned soldier, regarded the feudal cavalry as the real strength of an army, and on this occasion he had so little concern of the infantry that he only enforced the attendance of those who were bound to serve on horseback. Nevertheless, a large number of volunteers served on foot, nearly all of them being Welsh and Irish. But the gallant show was far from unanimous or wholehearted. The earls of Norfolk and Hereford refused to fight unless the king again confirmed the charters. But the Bishop of Durham and the earls of Lincoln and Warren pledged their word that if the king came back victorious, he would do what the two earls required. The English host now advanced into Scotland. Wallace had retired beyond the Forth, and no opposition was offered to Edward's advance to Edinburgh, whither the army went on slowly, plundering and devastating the country on the line of route. Having taken possession of the capital, Edward marched westwards as far as Kirkliston, a village on the borders of Mid and West Lothian, where he made a long halt. It was dangerous to advance farther until Durleton Castle between Edinburgh and Dunbar, which was strongly held by the Scots, had been captured, and when the warlike Bishop of Durham at last succeeded in this task, there were such grave difficulties in provisioning the army that Edward was still forced to remain stationary at Kirkliston. A contrary wind prevented the provision ships from sailing up the Forth and the only vessel that arrived had a large cargo of wine, which, by Edward's orders, were distributed among the soldiers. The irregular Welsh infantry had suffered most from the lack of victuals and were dying off in large numbers, but Edward now sent such a bountiful supply of wine to revive their spirits that they all got drunk. A quarrel broke out between the Welsh and the English men-at-arms. The Welsh slew eighteen Englishmen, but the English retaliated, killing a large number of Welshmen and putting the rest to flight. The Welsh now talked of joining the Scots. Edward professed to set little store on their action either way. What does it matter, he said, if enemies join with enemies? Welsh and Scots are alike our enemies. Let them go where they like, for with God's blessing we shall in one day obtain our revenge over both nations. But the lack of victuals continued, and on the 21st of July Edward gave orders to retreat to Edinburgh. 
At that moment, a boy brought the news that Wallace, having marched to within six leagues on the English, was encamped at Falkirk and proposed to follow the English up on their retreat to Edinburgh and surprise their camp on the following night. As the Lord lives, cried Edward, there will be no need for them to follow me, for on this very day I will march forward and meet them face to face. He at once ordered the English army to advance to Linlithgow, where it encamped in the presence of the enemy on the open heath. That night was an anxious one in the English camp. The prospect of battle had again reconciled the Welsh and English, and every man slept as best he might with his shield as his only pillow and his armor as his bedclothes, while the horses kept ready for action by their master's side had nothing to taste but the hard steel of their bits. In the midst of the night a wild cry arose in the English ranks. Everyone believed that the enemy was at hand, but all that had happened was that the horse of the king, tethered like that of the meanest trooper to his rider's side, had trodden upon the sleeping Edward and broken two of his ribs. But when day dawned, the king mounted his horse as if nothing had happened and marshaled his troops for the great battle that was at hand. It was the 22nd of July, the Feast of St. Mary Maudlin. At early dawn, the English marched through the streets of Linlithgow and saw the Scots' lances glistening on the crest of a neighboring hill. But when the English advanced, the enemy retreated to a remoter and stronger situation. A halt was therefore ordered, and mass was said before the king and bishop. The English then advanced against the army of Wallace, now drawn up to meet their attack. The generals of this period placed all their trust in the heavy-armed feudal cavalry. But with half the Scots nobles still waiting upon events, there was but a scanty muster of horsemen among the insurgent host, and Wallace was forced to rely on the footfolk that constituted the mass of his army. The great danger to infantry was lest they should be swept away and overwhelmed in the fierce rush of a heavy-armed cavalry charge. To prevent this, Wallace hit upon a novel plan, the conception of which shows him to have had the makings of a great general in him and strikingly anticipates Wellington's tactics at Waterloo. He drew his pikemen up in four great squares or circles in close formation and with palisades to further strengthen their ranks. A morass protected their front, archers filled up the gaps between the squares, and a scanty corps of mounted knights formed a rear guard. It was a strange order of battle and nothing like it, had been seen in Britain since the cavalry of William the Norman had scattered the footfolk of Harold on the hill of Hastings. An English poet describes vigorously enough the strange scene. Their spears point over a point, so sere and so thicka, on fast to get a joint, to say it was fair liquor, as a castell they stole that was walled with stone. They wende no man of blow to them sold af gone. As Wallace contemplated the novel array, he exclaimed triumphantly, I have brought you to the ring, hop gif ye can. But though the Scottish partisan had conceived the possibility of resisting cavalry by closely trained infantry planted in a compact mass, he was not destined to see the triumph of a system which within a generation was to revolutionize the art of warfare. The Scots at Falkirk did not succeed as the Flemings at Courtrai, the Swiss at Morgarten, and the very Scots themselves at Bannockburn succeeded in withstanding the fierce rush of the line of mail-clad warriors on their mail-clad steeds. The main reason for this was to be found in the generalship of Edward, who, while adhering in the main to the old-fashioned tactics of a cavalry charge, had skill enough to modify them in such a way as to meet the new danger involved in Wallace's formation. In three great battles or divisions, Edward poured his host onto the Scots' army. 
the first line stuck in the morass and fell into some confusion, but the second line wheeled about and vigorously assailed the enemy in flank. The scanty Scots horse galloped away in a panic. Their numbers were much too few to make resistance possible. But their withdrawal compelled the Scots archers also to seek safety in flight. This left the four squares to bear the whole brunt of Edward's attack. For some time the serried masses of pikemen held their own gallantly behind their palisades. Edward saw that there was no prospect of breaking through their ranks by the mere momentum of a cavalry charge. He therefore poured in showers of arrows upon the squares, and before long the deadly hail began to have its effect. Gaps were soon made in the ranks through which the English knights galloped in. With the breaking up of their ranks, the Scots' army was turned into a mob of fugitives. The light-armed Welsh and Irish footmen reaped the spoils of the victory. While heavy loss was inflicted on the Scots, only two knights and a few of the common folk fell on the English side. Wallace fled and soon withdrew from the country. His short, strange career of generalship ended as suddenly as it had begun. This is the more wonderful, as Edward reaped no very great results from his brilliant victory at Falkirk. He consumed a fortnight inactively at Stirling while his broken ribs grew together again. Lack of victuals prevented an advance beyond Perth, and compelled the abandonment of all thoughts of a conquest of the Highlands. Edward, on his recovery, resolved on the conquest of the southwest where Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, son of the cautious Lord of Lochmaben and grandson of the competitor, held the chief power, and strove to secure his own independence with little care for either side. But provisions were still harder to find upon the barren moors of Galloway than in the fair cornfields and pastures of the Lothians. September saw Edward back at Carlisle. Despite his great victory, the conquest of Scotland had hardly been begun. Operations for the year were perforce suspended when the selfish policy of Norfolk and Hereford insisted on an immediate return to their homes. End of section 17. Section 18 of Edward I by Thomas Frederick Tout. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12 The Conquest of Scotland, 1297 to 1305, Part 2. For nearly six years, Edward strove to complete that conquest of Scotland which he had begun by his victory at Falkirk. Year after year, he entered Scotland, and little by little, the stubborn Scots bent their backs to the English yoke. The courts of justice and the apparatus of government were transferred from London to York, and it seemed as if the old Roman city was again about to become the permanent capital of a united Britain. But all sorts of difficulties still stood in Edward's way. He still had to deal with the persistent agitation of his subjects for the renewal of the confirmation of the charters. He had still to conclude his intricate negotiations with the French king. He did not establish any real understanding with his subjects until 1301. His French troubles were not finally over until 1303. The peace with France involved both delays and difficulties. The truce was prolonged many times before it resulted in the formal treaty, signed 19th of June, 1299, at Montreuil, a town in Edward's own county of Ponthieu. In accordance with its provisions, Edward was married to Philip's sister Margaret, and his son Edward promised to Isabella, Philip's daughter. In return for this, Edward utterly abandoned his Flemish allies to the vengeance of the French king, 
though the Flemings declared that in so doing he broke an oath which he had sworn to Count Guy. But Edward was seldom over-scrupulous, and he had already obtained from Philip a similar abandonment of his allies, the Scots. But Philip was still unyielding as regards Gascony. On various pretexts, he still kept that duchy in his own hands, until, in 1302, the stubborn Flemings utterly defeated the chivalry of France in the famous Battle of Courtrai, where the tactics with which Wallace had failed to win the day at Falkirk were repeated with overwhelming effect against the best cavalry of Christendom. Philip now saw that he had plenty of work cut out for him at home, especially as his old strife with Boniface the Eighth had been recently renewed in a more inveterate and deadly form, and Boniface, changing his policy, strove to induce Edward to renew his attack on Philip. But Edward was of no mind to serve the Pope's turn, the more so as Philip, induced by necessity, now gave way about Gascony. In 1303, a definitive peace was signed between France and England. Gascony was restored, and an offensive and defensive alliance entered upon by the two kings. For the rest of his reign, Edward remained at peace with the nations of the continent. His persistency had in the long run overcome the duplicity of his neighbor. The struggle for the mastery in Britain could now be fought out on British soil unhindered by foreign intervention. The constitutional struggle was much harder to settle. The confirmation of the charters in 1297 proved not the end, but the beginning of a new and acrimonious controversy between the king and his subjects. The two earls were not satisfied with Edward's first ratification of his son's acts, and their hesitation to discharge their obligations against the Scots, unless Edward again confirmed the charters, was, as we have seen, a source of weakness to the king all through the Falkirk campaign. Next year, 1299, the demand for the further confirmation both of the Great Charter and of the Forest Charter was again raised. But like a true descendant of the Norman kings, Edward regarded the forests as the special property of the crown and resented all restriction of his forest rights as an insult both to his person and to his dignity. He was forced indeed to give way, but the blessings of the people were changed into curses when it was found that he had confirmed the forest charter with the proviso, saving the rights of the crown. A long agitation now broke out, during which neither side showed much temper or forbearance. Edward's evident reluctance to yield up any tittle of his prerogative, and his strong tendency to interpret any concession he made in the narrowest and most technical spirit, added to the exasperation of his subjects, while the old king grew beside himself with fury when he found his barons and parliaments perfectly indifferent to the progress of his Scottish conquest and persistently refusing all help except on the terms of his complete submission. Very reluctantly and unwillingly, Edward yielded to the inevitable in the Parliament of 1300 and by the issue of the Articuli Supercartas, evaded a formal confirmation by accepting in another way the main conditions imposed on him by his subjects. But even then he had no peace. In 1301 a new parliament assembled at Lincoln, where a clever combination against the king was carried through by the dexterous diplomacy of Archbishop Winchelsea. The estates demanded the removal of the treasurer, Walter Langdon, Bishop of Lichfield, and the chief minister of Edward's later years. Again, Edward was forced to an almost unconditional submission through which he saved his minister. In 
after all the Scots war, lay nearest to his heart, and he at length saw that as long as king and people were divided, the Scots could never be subdued. Edward had made great concessions, both to France and to his parliaments, in order to isolate the Scots from all moral and material support. But a third obstacle now interposed itself between him and his revolted subjects, in a peremptory order from Boniface the Eighth, that Edward should desist from the Scots' war. Scotland, said the Pope, was a fief of the Holy See. To wage war against the Scots was to rob the papacy of its choicest prerogative of protecting its obedient subjects. The claim was first put before Edward while besieging Calaveric. Winchelsea was, as usual, on the Pope's side. He now sought out the king in Galloway with a papal envoy in his train. Edward's hot temper fired up as the archbishop exhorted him, in biblical phrase, to desist from further hostilities. By God's blood, he cried, I will not hold my peace for Sion, nor keep silence for Jerusalem, but I will maintain my right, which all the world knows, with all my might. In the Lincoln Parliament, Winchelsea was again active in pressing the Pope's claim but the barons, though they joined with the archbishop in his demand for the confirmation of the charters, stood manfully for the king in resisting this new and unheard-of papal pretension. A spirited remonstrance was drawn up in the name of the barons, which declared in good round terms that the pope's interference was meddlesome and intolerable. The result was that the relations between England and Rome again became strained. As a further result, Boniface's attitude left Edward in no mood to listen to the entreaties of the Pope to take up his side in the great struggle that now broke out between France and the papacy. Edward was too pious and too busy at home to join actively in Philip's violent and brutal onslaughts on the unhappy Pope. But the fall and death of Boniface in 1303, and the thorough subjugation of the papacy to France which followed, taught Edward to estimate at their true value the thunders of Rome. He was at last free from papal as from baronial and foreign opposition. During the weary years of threefold strife, Edward had still turned his whole available energies to the reconquest of Scotland, though he had made little progress. In 1299, the barons had refused to follow him, as his promises to keep the charters were still unratified. After his submission in 1300, Edward was able to take the field with a gallant army that marched from Carlisle to the conquest of the southwest. The most famous incident in this campaign was the capture of Calaveric, a stronghold held by only sixty men against Edward's great host, and commemorated in a French poem dear to genealogists and heralds. In 1301, Edward was again in Scotland, and after conquering the greater part of the land south of the Forth, he took up his winter quarters in the old palace of the Scots kings at Linlithgow. Early in 1302, Edward held a round table at Falkirk to celebrate the progress of his conquest. But though the Scots yielded before the advance of his troops, they were still far from being subdued. In 1303, the Scots surprised and defeated the king's troops at the Battle of Roslyn. This was their last great success. In 1303, the real conquest of Scotland began. Edward was at last free to devote all his energy to the task, and long years of warfare had worn out the energies of the long-suffering Scots. Edward's work now seemed quite a simple one. Edward next made a great progress through Scotland, 
which recalls the famous march of 1296. He marched through Perth, Brechen, and Aberdeen to Banff. As far north as Caithness, the weight of his arm was felt, and the Highland chieftains flocked to his camp to make their submission. At last, John Coleman, who had governed Scotland since Falkirk as regent for King John, despaired of further resistance and made his peace with Edward. The only strong place that now held out was Stirling. Edward took up his winter quarters at Dunfermline, where, so peaceful was the country now, he was joined by his young queen. With the spring of 1304, the attack on Stirling began. It was a siege conducted with all the military skill known at the time. Huge wooden machines cast stones weighing two or three hundred weight into the castle. Battering rams were brought to bear against the walls. Movable turrets were wheeled up against the battlements, and the fosses were filled up with stones and earth. At last, on the 20th of July, the scanty garrison surrendered. There was no longer any organized resistance to Edward's authority in Scotland. But Wallace, the hero of the First Revolt, who had almost disappeared from history after his defeat at Falkirk, now again came on the scene. His old fame was half forgotten, and the long struggle had disheartened the Scots too much for them to venture upon a fresh rising. The hero lurked in the woods and hills with a scanty following, while Edward, secure of his triumph, returned to England, and, as a sign that the war was over, ordered the return of the courts of justice and officers of state from York to Westminster. Nor was the king's confidence ill-grounded. In the summer of 1305, Wallace was captured through the treachery of a Scot and brought to London for trial. Condemned as traitor, murderer, and incendiary, Wallace suffered in due course the terrible penalties of the English law of treason. His death has been made a matter of reproach to Edward, on the ground that, unlike most of his countrymen, he had never become the king's vassal. But the evidence of this fact is not very good. Moreover, the laws of war were stern in the 14th century, and no technical claim of right was likely to protect the very soul of the long resistance of Scotland. Edward acted as anyone else would have acted in his place. In holding out against Edward, Wallace knew full well that he carried his life in his hands. It adds rather than lessens the glory of the Scottish hero that in due course he paid the penalty of his heroism and self-devotion. But the special glory of Wallace belongs to a later age, when the songs of the Scottish bards had made him the popular hero of the War of Independence. Edward now drew up a scheme for the government of Scotland. A very limited parliament met in September 1305 to settle the question. In this assembly, Edward, true to his doctrine of popular control, caused ten representatives of the Scottish estates to appear. These included two bishops, two earls, two abbots, two barons, and two representatives of the commons, one for the north and the other for the south. The English were represented by twenty magnates. Scots and English lords together drafted a plan for the future administration of the conquered realm. This was the Ordinance for the Government of Scotland, the last and perhaps the most striking of Edward's many claims to statesmanship. Admitting that Scotland was to be ruled by Edward at all, it is hard to see how the government of Scotland could have been better arranged than by this plan. John of Brittany, Edward's faithful nephew, was made warden or lieutenant of the whole land, with the ordinary officers of state under him. For the purposes of justice, Scotland, like Wales, was divided into large districts, 
eight judges were chosen, two for the Lothians and the other English lands south of the Forth, two for the Welsh or British lands of Galloway and Strathclyde, two for the English-speaking lands between the Forth and the Grampians, and two for the Celtic Highlands. Sheriffs, coroners, and the other officers of the English shire system were appointed to hold office during the king's pleasure. They were to be either Englishmen or Scotsmen. The rude Celtic laws, the laws of the Bretts or Welsh in Strathclyde, and the laws of the Scots or Highlanders, were, like the Welsh laws of Howell Da, repugnant to Edward's notions of justice. They were therefore to be swept away, and replaced by the English and Norman laws which, since the days of King David, had prevailed in the Scottish lowlands. John of Brittany was instructed to assemble the good folk of the land of Scotland in some fixed place, and ascertain from them what King David's laws really were, and what additions had been subsequently made to them. He was also directed to redress and amend such of the Scots' laws as were plainly against God and reason, taking the advice of both English and Scottish counsellors in arriving at this result, and referring all decisions of great importance to the immediate judgment of the King of England. Thus, by Edward's scheme, a separate administration was provided for Scotland, though the Scots were secured with some measure of representation in the English Parliament. For the most part, the Scots administration was put into Scots' hands, and the prospect of a great legislative reform in the immediate future was an additional inducement for the Scots to accept the new constitution with its program of practical reforms and strong, sound rule as a substitute for their old turbulent independence. But it was too late for conciliation. Nearly twenty years of warfare and hatred had worked out their fateful results. Nothing but sheer force kept Scotland obedient to her foreign conqueror. Half Scotland waited for an opportunity for rebellion. That opportunity was not long in coming. End of section 18《Section 19 of Edward I by Thomas Frederick Tout. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13 The End of the Reign, 1305 to 1307. With Scotland subdued and apparently appeased, Edward was again able to turn his mind to English affairs. He was a man slow to forgive and tenacious in his policy. He had neither forgotten nor forgiven the humiliations inflicted upon him by the union of the baronial and clerical opposition in the years between 1297 and 1301. He still chafed at the restraints then imposed upon his prerogative and his pious fear of breaking the oath he had so unwillingly sworn only added to his restlessness and uneasiness. The baronial opposition was already broken up. Hereford died in 1298, and Norfolk had completely abased himself by a temporary surrender of his estates to the crown and by receiving them back, fettered with the obligations of a conditional estate that came under the provisions of the statute quia emptores. Edward was thus in a position to carry out a policy which he had devised to prevent a renewal of the baronial opposition. His greatest danger was from the higher aristocracy represented by the great earls. The earldom of the days of Edward stood in a very different position to the somewhat commonplace dignity which goes by the same name in the 19th century. The earldom was still the highest rank of the peerage. It still retained some traces of its earlier position as the official head of a county. It involved a great position both in the court and in the nation. 
The number of earls was so scanty that each individual earl was personally and territorially important. In the earls, the people saw their natural leaders. Edward's plan seems to have been to prevent a renewal of the baronial opposition and to add to the strength of the crown by getting as many of the great fiefs as he could under his direct control. Circumstances favored his design, and a series of luckiest sheets and well-designed marriages much facilitated the process. In 1300, the death of Edward's cousin, Edmund of Almain, threw the rich earldom of Cornwall into the king's hands. On the death of the Earl of Norfolk in 1306, his earldom also was sheeted to the crown for lack of heirs to his body. Contemporary writers put Edward's lucky acquisition of these two great earldoms side by side with his conquests of Wales and Scotland. The young Earl Humphrey of Hereford married in 1302 the king's daughter Elizabeth, the Welsh woman, the widowed Countess of Holland. Meanwhile, former efforts in the same direction were bearing fruit. Joan of Acker administered the Gloucester inheritance of Edward's youthful grandson. The young Thomas of Lancaster, Derby, and Leicester was expecting the succession of Lincoln and Salisbury. Edward of Carnarvon now ruled over Wales and the earldom of Chester. Edward and his near kin thus enjoyed a remarkable concentration of the great earldoms in their hands. The policy had a temporary success, and perhaps accounts in part for the cessation of the baronial opposition in the last years of Edward's reign. But the policy had its dangerous side, and its permanent results were by no means favorable either to the dignity of the crown or to the prosperity of the nation. The chroniclers attribute the decadence that set in after Edward's death to the dying out of so many of the old earldoms. Still, Edward's policy was at least a thoroughly English policy, and if it failed, it failed largely because by identifying the younger branches of the royal house with the ancient feudal dynasties, it also identified them with the hereditary jealousies and factions of the old lines of earls. It had the merit of making impossible a royal caste, cut off by rigid laws of etiquette and pride of birth from the general mass of the nobility. It was both the strength and the weakness of Edward that while he was politically but the greatest official in the kingdom, he was socially but the head of the English aristocracy. Though he firmly believed that his power was of God, he never aspired to be the semi-divine ruler set by his birth and position upon a pedestal that kept him solitary and apart from the life of the country over which he ruled. The baronial opposition being thus got rid of, the clerical opposition alone remained to be dealt with. Winchelsea was still unreconciled, but Winchelsea held a great position and could not easily be attacked. Since the Falkirk campaign, Bishop Beck of Durham had, to Edward's intense disgust, posed as the champion of clerical privilege and of local independence, and was now closely allied with Archbishop Winchelsea. But Beck got mixed up in obscure struggles with his chapter, and on his setting out for Rome in 1302, without the king's permission, Edward took into his own hands the rich temporalities of his see. On his return, Beck submitted himself to Edward, who restored him his lands. But fresh difficulties soon drove Beck back to the papal court, where he obtained in 1305 the sounding title of Patriarch of Jerusalem. Edward complained that he had obtained from the Pope grants injurious to the rights of the crown, took away from him the whole Durham Palatinate, and never left him in peace for the rest of his life. When Edward pursued Beck, with whom he had no personal quarrel, with such unremitting rancor, it was plain that he was only waiting his opportunity to inflict an even more signal vengeance on the hated archbishop. In 1305, 
the favour of Philip the Fair secured the papacy for Edward's Gascon subject, Bernard de Goth, Archbishop of Bordeaux, who assumed the name of Clement V. As evidence of his subservience to the French king, Clement now transferred the seat of the papacy from Italy to France and began that fatal seventy years of Babylonish captivity which did so much to lower the Holy See both in actual power and popular esteem. Clement showed almost as much deference to Edward as to Philip. His submissive attitude gave opportunity for Edward to work out a great plan of revenge, while it encouraged king and nation alike to enter into a course of anti-Roman legislation that was England's revenge for Pope Boniface's slights upon her independence. Edward still fretted under his obligations to observe the charters. As soon as Clement had become Pope, he applied for and obtained a dispensation from his oath to observe the charters in their new and enlarged form. The complacent Pope at once gave the required absolution, and Edward issued a new ordinance of the forest, in which he repudiated those portions of the revised forest charter which had so long offended his sense of dignity. Further action he did not take, and this must be considered a sign of moderation, for Clement's bull was so wide in its wording that it would have empowered Edward, if he had mind to it, to repudiate the whole of the additions to the great charter wrung from him in 1297. This shows that Edward had no design of violating the essential elements of the English constitution, but it was at best a great falling away from the old king to revert to the worst precedents of his stormy youth. This declension from the doctrine of keep troth may tend to take the king off the lofty pedestal on which his admirers have sometimes placed him. But nothing was more natural for a medieval king than to submit his conscience to his interests, and in no way did the papacy exercise a more demoralizing influence upon Europe than through the facility with which it gave men of easy or formal honesty a means of sheltering their weakness under the protecting aegis of the church. The king's vengeance was now turned on the able and accomplished primate, whose rigid regard for the interests of his cloth and persistent hostility to the crown were now to be atoned for by a signal fall. Winchelsea's relations with Edward had been further complicated by a fierce and unworthy quarrel with Edward's favorite minister, Bishop Walter Langton. The archbishop had accused Langton of simony, adultery, murder, and intercourse with the devil, but the minister had been triumphantly acquitted of these foul and monstrous charges, and now pursued the primate with a deadly hatred. A long accusation was sent up to the papal court against Winchelsea, of which the most serious part was a charge of treason, based upon his conduct in the Parliament of Lincoln in 1301. Clement again showed the utmost willingness to oblige the king. Winchelsea was suspended and summoned to appear before the papal court. In a last stormy interview, the archbishop besought the king for leave to quit his kingdom. Permission to go, said Edward, right willingly we give, but permission to return thou shalt never have. We know thy craft, thy subtlety, thy treachery, and thy treason. The pope will deal with thee as thou deservest. Favor at our hands thou must never expect. Merciless hast thou been to others, mercy to thyself will we never show. Edward was as good as his word, and for the rest of his reign, Winchelsea remained in poverty and exile. But Edward quickly quarreled with the complacent Pope on the question of the administration of the lapsed revenues of the See of Canterbury, and Edward was fully backed up by the rising anti-papal feeling in the nation. The spirit which had animated the barons at Lincoln culminated in 1307 in the famous Statute of Carlisle, the first act of anti-Roman legislation in England, 
nothing but Edward's death prevented a regular breach with the Pope. Never did Edward's affairs seem more flourishing than in the early part of 1306. Scotland remained subdued, the French were friendly, the Pope was the king's creature, the barons and commons were alike well disposed, and the arch-enemy Winchelsea was in exile. Though old and stiff, Edward remained in good health. He had recently taken vigorous steps to grapple with the administrative disorder which was almost chronic in the Middle Ages, and nothing had made the old king better liked among peace-loving men than his putting down by his writs of trail baston the groups of armed ruffians who worked all sorts of misdeeds. The only drop of bitterness in the cup of his happiness was the unworthy conduct of his son and heir. Immense pains had been taken to instruct the young Edward in martial accomplishments and drill him in the principles and routine of business and statecraft. But within the tall, strong, handsome frame of the young prince was the heart of a coward and trifler. He had no serious interests, wasted his time in gambling and rioting in low society, and cared for nothing but his horses, hounds, players, and boon companions. In 1305, the young Edward had incurred his father's ire by a wanton attack upon Bishop Langton, and was with difficulty restored to favor by the good offices of his stepmother. The certainty that there was no guarantee that his policy should be continued after his death must have weighed heavily upon the aged king. Terrible news now came from Scotland. Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, grandson of the claimant, now head of his house by his father's death, had for several years been among Edward's Scottish partisans. But he now withdrew himself from the court and took horse for Scotland, where on the 10th of February, 1306, he met John Comyn, the former regent, in the Franciscan convent in Dumfries. The two men were old rivals, the representatives of houses long hostile to each other. A dispute broke out, hot words passed, swords were drawn, and Comyn was slain. Bruce was now forced to become a fugitive, and in self-defense was compelled to identify himself with the party of Scottish independence, with which, in recent years, he had been secretly intriguing. He found that the spirit of Scottish nationality still burned as fiercely as ever. He soon manifested a skill and daring that shows him to have been a born leader of men. Before Lent was out, half Scotland was again in revolt. On the 25th of March, Bruce was crowned King of Scots at Scone. A few strong castles with their English garrisons and a few nobles jealous of Bruce's progress alone actively upheld the English cause. The ill tidings of the Scottish revolt were brought to Edward in Dorsetshire, whither he had gone on a hunting expedition. He burst into a terrible explosion of wrath and resolved to stamp out all resistance in the stubborn and intractable nation on which all clemency was thrown away. Troops were at once dispatched to the north, and a great gathering of the younger nobles was summoned to Westminster to prepare for an expedition of crushing numbers and force. The king was now so infirm that he could not ride, and was taken from Winchester to London in a horse litter. On Whitsunday he held a gorgeous pageant at Westminster. He solemnly dubbed his son Edward a knight. Three hundred young men of noble houses gathered together in the Abbey Church to receive the same honor from their future king. There was such a pressure round the high altar of the Abbey that two of the new knights were crushed to death by the throng. Then two swans, their necks encircled with chains of gold, were brought in. Edward now vowed by God and the swans that he would at once set out to Scotland and avenge the wrongs done to Holy Church and the realm by the rebellious murderers of John Comyn. When Bruce was subdued, the king pledged himself that he would no more bear arms against Christian men 
but would go to the Holy Land and die fighting against the infidel. The prince and the other new knights took the same vow, and the musters were ordered to assemble early in July at Carlisle. Thither the Prince of Wales was at once sent. Edward followed his son as quickly as his infirmities would allow. On Michaelmas Day, Edward reached the Austin Priory of Lanarkost near Carlisle. There he took up his quarters for more than half a year. As the state of his health and his business with the Pope combined to make it impossible for him to take the field in person. But the heavy hand of his generals was laid upon Scotland, and the new King Robert was soon reduced to such straits that he fled to the Western Isles for refuge, while the stern resolve of the old king to have done with clemency involved the unhappy Scots in worse desolation and destruction than ever. Many Scottish nobles were taken prisoners and at once put to death as traitors. Their lands were confiscated and handed over to English earls in Edward's confidence. Bruce's own domains were overrun. Carrick was bestowed on Henry Percy. Annandale went to the young Earl of Hereford. Another son-in-law of the king had the great earldom of Athol. This time Scotland was to be held by chains of iron in the merest and barest slavery. Yet even in his worst moods, Edward bade his soldiers spare the common folk, whose only crime was obedience to the orders of their natural lords. He sternly rebuked the Prince of Wales for his indulgence in an indiscriminate slaughter that distinguished neither leader from follower nor grown man from woman and child. Edward suffered much from sickness during his stay at Lanarkost, but he still found energy enough to move in March of 1307 to Carlisle to meet the Parliament which he had summoned to assemble on the border city. With the return of summer, bad news again came from the seat of war. Bruce returned from his hiding place and the goodwill of the mass of the population again allowed him to make headway against the strong armies of Edward. As soon as Parliament was over, the old king resolved to take the field in person. He offered up in the cathedral church the horse litter which had conveyed him from the south, and again mounted his charger and put himself at the head of the army that was pouring into Scotland but his great spirit was no longer able to command his failing body. For two successive days he struggled on, but each day he could only manage to ride two miles, and on the third day he was forced to rest altogether. On the fourth day Edward managed to reach Burgon Sands, a village less than six miles from Carlisle. He was now attacked by dysentery and sank rapidly. As he lay dying, he sent his last words of counsel to his absent son. He urged him to persevere in the subjection of Scotland and to avoid unworthy favorites. His last thoughts turned to the two great enterprises on which he had bent his mind, the subjection of Scotland and the recovery of the Holy Land. Even after his death, he longed to share in those great works. He begged his son to carry his bones about with him in his Scottish campaigns, so that even the dead Edward might still lead his warriors to victory against the hated enemy. He also requested that his heart should be sent to the Holy Land with a train of a hundred knights to fight for the recovery of the sepulcher of the Lord. He then prepared himself for death, and with a prayer for the divine mercy on his lips, passed quietly away on the 7th of July, 1307, at the age of 68. With the great king died his great work, and the tragedy of his end was made more pitiful by the wretched farce of the reign of Edward II. His dying wishes were set at naught. The Scots campaign was given up. His body was sent with scanty reverence to an immediate burial place at Westminster, where it now reposes under a plain monument of grey marble, but little corresponding to his greatness as a king, and upon which has been inscribed, Eduardus primus scotorum malius, hic est, pactum serva. <laughs>
but it was not only by reason of his son's unworthiness that Edward's most cherished plans were doomed to failure. He had attempted more than even his strong purpose could have successfully accomplished. But if an independent Scotland bore witness that Edward's most cherished ambition was a failure, his work lived on in his own realm of England, where after ages agreed to recognize in him one of the greatest and wisest of her rulers, and where the whole subsequent history of the land he loved so well bore daily witness to the strength and endurance of his policy. End of section 19. Recorded by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, November 2016. End of Edward I by Thomas Frederick Tout.